That was my wee brother Ewan, visiting some of our heroes out in Iraq. But Erskine homes are full of heroes. Let's go inside and meet some of them. There was born up with uh, the troopers on the landmine. And there was four of us went to the hospital right away. <clears throat> and the doctor in the hospital says, I'll take his over. OK, OK, OK. And then he looked at me and said, he's dead. And that did happen. I did die, but I was brought back to life. And the three of the doctors said, live, live, live. I was dead, dead, dead. And I was, I was the only one that lived. I discovered I had a, a brain tumour, which was giving me epileptic fits. And so I was discharged in 1989, uh, just as the battalion was getting ready to go to Germany. I was on an assault course, but unfortunately, the way I landed, um, I broke my back. I was in a big army camp called Stalagate B, and we heard the rifle shot. We knew the break had been discovered. They came through checking on who was covering up or missing. They knew that I wasn't Thompson from the photograph that had been taken when you entered the camp. And I was tuffed out into the snow, down to the main gate of the camp, and not knowing what was going to happen. I started off at Gazala in West Africa at the East Army Signals headquarters. I was courier to General Montgomery, and uh, I took the divisional messages round because Monty didn't believe in press coverage. That was out. So it was, there was nothing else for it but wireless silence, telephone silence, no dispatch riders, and only one person delivering the messages. Yours truly. He had one over just the front door was cut away and the cement kept and we, we would dig a hole and made a wee tunnel. And we used to hide in there. And the Germans used to come to the door and shut the door and stand in this step. And we were underneath. If they discovered they were in their farm, the whole family would be shot. Erskine? Oh, well, I don't think there are enough superlatives to describe it as far as I'm concerned. It's absolutely wonderful, I think, in every aspect from the top, right down, everything, everything about it. I've only been in one other nursing home, and that was visiting my husband while he waited to get in here. And it was just a case of they ate their meals, then we just sat round the wall till the next meal. So then his name came up for in here. So he was in right away. I saw, I, I shouldn't say bad words, but it was like coming from hell into heaven. And he's been so well cared for. Though, he just lies. I think he'd been dead long ago. If it wasn't for the care in here. I think carers are all special people. You've got to have, you've got to be special. You, I don't mean special, you've got to want to do it. It's, um, if, if, you've got to like what you're doing, love what you're doing. I think the caring, the compassion they've got for all the men. They look after them, they look after their families, as well as the men that are in here. Sometimes you find that they're maybe a wee bit upset about something, and they'll not want to speak to them to make them more upset, then they'll come to us. It does change your mind when you come to work and you see everything what happens and they're looking after them and the satisfaction you get in your job. At first, I was actually so scared. I didn't have a clue what I was going to be doing. I didn't know how I was going to be helping. And um, it was that 
it was the sort of age gap that was scaring me. But now that I'm here, it's brilliant. And all the guys, you can have such a good banter with them and you can just joke with them and that's the best way of it. You don't even think mm. about it. You don't even think of the age gap or whatever else. At the end of the day, it's just another person and they're all great characters in here. We're taught, if you want, when we're working here, that, that the residents don't live in our place of work. You know what I mean? We, we work in their home, uh, and it's their home primarily. And everybody here, whether it's from the IT to the, the, the sort of the, the domestics, the hands-on carers, the fundraisers, everybody here is here for one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to care for ex-service men and women. You know, there's no other reason for us being here. There's no reason for the building being here other than, than to provide care. If I'd ended up going to a hospital ward somewhere, the facilities wouldn't be such that I could be independent. Whereas here, I had my own room, my own wet room. I was able to get out. I was able to go out in the grounds and wheel round, keep my fitness up, um, go to physiotherapy, um, which obviously was good that I could carry that on. Um, so it's, it's just been a great facility for me, really. When I came here, I couldn't walk. I couldn't talk. I couldn't use my memory, but as the years passed and the, the nurses and that gave me treatment, had a lot of treatment, made an awful difference. No, I don't mean that. A wheelchair, I don't need to walk six. I just you can talk, but I've still got a hell of a bad memory. But otherwise, this place has made a hell of a difference to me. It's quite humbling at times uh, to, to see guys who have been injured on act, active service, whether it be physically or mentally, and, and they still have a pride in themselves uh, and, and in Erskine. I thought it was just a, a place for wounded souls and that to come back to when it, it was in the 1960s. Um, but now I understand that it's for every ex-serviceman and it's just brilliant. It's a fantastic place to work and a fantastic place for the ex servicemen to come. When we first came here, I was quite content to sit in my cottage and quite happy to grow old there. Um, but somewhere in, in the way Erskine works, they had a different plan. They wanted to draw me out of, of the cottage. They wanted to draw me into Erskine. Um, I call it the, the stealth care, because they, they care for you without you even knowing you know, that it's happening. So Erskine gave me the opportunity to, to sort of go to college. So what I was learning at college, I sort of put into practice at Erskine, and it sort of has, has grown from, from there to sort of now being a fully-fledged IT department. Uh, I was ill for five years, and I, just, I, I got to the stage where I decided it was time to get back into the workplace, and this is the ideal place for me to come because I'm here under supported employment. The employment ethos of the operations side of Erskine, which the print department is, is part of, predominantly it's, it's been ex-service guys or disabled ex-service men. Um, and I have to say they put most of the able-bodied people to shame by their dedication. And it's obviously comes from their service background. Uh, when I wasn't working there for a while, I just felt uh, kind of useless. You know, I wasn't any good to anybody. Uh, but now I feel as well, you know, I'm, I'm doing something worthwhile now, so. It's a perfect place to come, because it's so friendly, and I don't think I see a resident. I've never seen one complain. I've never seen one looking sad. Everybody's always got a smile on their face. Well, I think it's what you make of it, really. You've got all the privileges of being at home, and uh, you've got medical advice more or less on hand. It's a very good, very cooperative here. And if you have a problem, you can talk it over with you. When I arrived here on the 21st of March, 2007, they sat me down at the lunch table in the dining room and uh, Audrey was sitting right across from me. And from then we just became friends. We argue a lot. Oh yes, Navy and Army, definitely. <laughs> 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 Just shut up. <laughs> <laughs> if you were to ask me what is recreation, I would say it's simply being there for the residents.
to give them a better quality of life. They have so much entertainment and everything's all thought out and planned. And the amount of work that they do, even in that aspect alone, I mean, how they do it and it runs as a charity. I've done a lot of things here I've never done in my life before. I've learned to play chess since I come in here, so I've been pretty well occupied. I only started swimming last year <laughs> at 92. I would love to play balls. They say, pay a lot of sex awareness if you how to play balls. The whole obstacle had no balance. I said, I can't play bloody balls. He says, well, those pieces can play balls. Then I looked again, they had no legs. I was like, oh, my God. So you can do it, I can do it. The company's good. I'm looked after. What more do I need now? It's like coming into the differences from being in the field with all the sort of trauma and, and uh, worry at times to... Uh, and suddenly realise that you've nothing else to worry about. Everything's done for you. It shows you the dedication of everybody that knows Erskine, that they seem to do their very best to raise money and do all the things that's necessary. I got a letter, obviously an error, and it said um, they were short of people to abseil down the fourth road bridge and I wrote it and then thanked them very much for inviting me. But I thought my crutches would maybe get in the road and she phoned me up and she burst out laughing and she says, don't think that you can't do anything. She says, you can get a can and stick it in your lounge. And I'm on to seven or eight cans later and every time the can gives more money than the previous one. It's quite incredible. And yet it's the same size as a can, you know? It's wonderful how people just know the name. Erskine's enough. Now it's your turn to be a hero by donating whatever you can. Every penny counts. And these guys will salute you. It's for every ex serviceman and it's just brilliant. It's a fantastic place for the ex serviceman to come. I couldn't wish for a happier situation, really. And he's been so well cared for. And the loving care and attention is excellent. This place made a hell of a difference to me.